What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU podcast. As always, thank you all for joining me. So in this episode, I am joined by two very special guests, LSU baseball legends, and they happen to be my friends and former teammates. So it's a double plus for me. But before the introduction of my two special guests, a quick reminder, as always, you can find the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, and other major audio platforms. If you're catching this on the YouTube channel, Please make sure to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on any of the content throughout the season. And then on Twitter, the account is at 60FT6INLSUPOD. Make sure to follow. Hit that notifications bell as well. So if y'all missed the last episode, I went live with an instant analysis podcast. After the A&M series, I was joined by Alex Day of the Weekend Rotation podcast and then Matt Beard of the Spittin' Seeds 247 account. So as always, that podcast is linked on the Twitter account and both YouTube and podcast versions. So, without further ado, let me introduce my first guest, Eddie Furness. For those of y'all that are viewing this or listening to this, and if you're too young to remember number 36, all you need to do is next time you go in the box, just look around the stadium, and his number is retired. And also, next, what type of player was Eddie? Just picture a combination of Dylan Cruz and Tommy Tanks as a hitter, and then put that guy on first, and that's Furness. So Eddie played at LSU from 95 to 98, a two-time national champion in 1996 and 1997. Big Ed was a 1996 consensus first-team All-American in 96. He was also the Southeastern Conference Player of the Year, a second-team All-American in 97. All he did in 1998 was hit 403 with 27 doubles and 28 home runs and 76 RBIs. In 1998, Eddie was the Dick Hauser Trophy winner, which is college baseball's most outstanding player. And then to cap it all off, Eddie was inducted into the College Baseball Hall of Fame, the LSU Athletic Hall of Fame, and the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. Eddie, what's going on, buddy? Thank you for joining me. How are you doing, man? Man, it's awesome to be with you. I love doing podcasts. And uh, to have a, a good friend and a teammate start a podcast like this and do such a good job, I'm really super excited to be on with you. No, man, I appreciate the kind words. It's uh, I'm looking. I was thinking about this all day, so I'm a little nervous, but really excited because I think it's going to turn out awesome. So I appreciate your time. And joining Eddie and myself is none other than Blair Barbier. Once again, for those that are too young to remember Blair, number four. Just think of Gavin Dugas as a modern day Blair Barbier. Blair, I hope you're okay with that comparison. And this is why it kind of hit me the other day. Look, Blair started at second base in the 1997 national championship team. And then he finished his career in 2000 playing third base. So he has flexibility on the infield like Dugas, both Louisiana boys, Dugas from home Blair from New Orleans. Power, easy double digit home run guys. They can hit for average. So he's gonna hit over 300. You can check that box. He's gonna take a walk. He's gonna get hit by a pitch. It doesn't matter. Blair was gonna do whatever it took to get that W that day. So Blair was the all SEC infielder at LSU, four year letterman captain of the 2000 team where he was named to the college world series all tournament team and all blair did for his career was hit 307 with 46 home runs yes ladies and gentlemen we could absolutely rake back in the day 62 doubles with 199 rbis and then the interesting thing about blair is he got into coaching for a little while after that as he was an assistant coach at mcneese and then under paul maneri at lsu for a little while my buddy blair bear boot what's up man thank you for joining me i appreciate your time brother What's up, Moo? Yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be on with Big Ed. Um, you know, tough to follow up. You know, Ed's all. all <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Look, I just went, Eddie got the LSU first. <laughs> I, <appreciate> it. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. I thought about going alphabetical, but I was like, well, Eddie got here first. So that's how I'm going to justify it. Look, come on. You got plenty of accolades to go along with you, too, my man. So, all good, baby. All good. No, oh, I knew I was going to catch that. I knew it. I knew it. So, look, some of y'all may be asking who tune into the pod is, why did I choose these two guys? Well, first of all, it's my podcast, and I'm going to pick whoever I want to, right? I can have whoever I want on the show as I want to. But a couple of weeks ago, I was watching LSU, and this team had all the preseason accolades, right? Consensus number one team, all the hype that goes along with it, number one transfer portal class, number one high school recruiting class. And both of these guys really fit that bill when you look at the freshmen that have played a big role for LSU in this year. They both started right away for four years as freshmen. And they both experienced national championship teams and the pressure that goes along with being, you know, an LSU program really at its heyday. And hopefully we're coming back to that in the Jay Johnson era. So they were also amazing hitters while they were in the purple and gold. 
So I wanted to get their take on what they see from this lineup. And then once again, you know, as we're going to get into it, we're going to focus on how they would go about hitting some of the pitchers that LSU has on their staff. So um, first thing I want to discuss is the freshmen on this team, guys. You know, when you look at it, you have three guys that have really stood up. You know, they're contributing every day. They're in the lineup now. You can just pencil those guys in like Kling in the outfield. Brady Neal is catching. And then you have big Jared Bear Jones who's been showing off his power. You know what? Eddie, we'll just start with you first. And Blair, you can follow up. So, Eddie, you got to LSU in 95 as a freshman. LSU had just been to the College World Series in 1994. They didn't advance. They didn't get very far. But as a freshman, when you came into 95, what were the expectations of yourself walking into this program and the success that it had been having on the field so far? Well, you know, I would say I was pretty naive. Um, I felt like I was going to start um, the whole time. It, that was probably pretty arrogant. And, you know, it just I just kind of had that feeling. And, um, you know, of course, I ended up being a DH. And I never really thought about, you know, the the pressure behind it. I just thought I was supposed to do it. It's just kind of one of those deals that you're thrown out there. Now, I will say this. I did feel a lot of pressure once it happened. Um, I did feel the youth out there on the field. We had, a, you know, as opposed to teams now, you have a lot more, we have a lot more seniors on that team. We, we had a lot of fifth year guys on the field, um, 95 and, in, and even in 96. So a lot of older guys and you feel physically, I felt weak compared to a lot of the players really? I was playing against. I just well, hadn't matured physically yet. Um, I felt like that was a, more of a the, the, as a sophomore. So, I mean, I felt like I could hit, I could put barrels in the ball, but I was definitely struggling mentally and, and, and nerves and, you know, where do I really fit in? And, you know, hitting, I mean, gosh, and Blair's probably the same way. And when you're hitting less than 450, you know, growing up through through <laughs> high school and in summer ball, you're like, golly, man, I'm really sucking right now. I'm hitting 425. <laughs> Right. Um, and then you get to LSU, you're less than 300 and you feel like you just suck. Like something really happened and you're just terrible. If you're hitting 275, 280, you're like, this is terrible. And you really don't, you're not used to getting out a lot. And so that's another thing I feel like as a freshman is, is getting used to missing, swinging and missing. And then every time you put the ball in play, if you don't get it in the air hard, it's an out. I mean, it's, it's different and yeah. it really gets on you. Interesting. That's um, and to let everybody know, like, right, I was a pitcher. These two guys were hitters. So we hung out. But like, I didn't see these guys at all during practice. I'm shagging their fly balls. I'm chasing home run balls. So a lot of these things we're going to talk about tonight, you just don't think about it. Like we were talking about before we started, like you're in the middle of it. I'm just not going to go up to be like, hey, Ed, how are you feeling? Are you doing OK as you're as a freshman in 95 when I was trying to get used to it? And then, you know, Blair, I started thinking about your story, right? So we win the national championship in 1996 on a walk-off bomb. You had signed with LSU. Warren Morris hits that bomb, and you're like, I'm going to go play for those guys. And then second base, as far as I can remember, was vacant. Like, it, there was – no, obviously I haven't gotten into your recruiting story or anything like that, but as far as I remember, it was vacant. So how did you feel as a freshman knowing those dudes just won the national championship? We're going to be preseason top five. And then you're walking into that locker room and you're looking around like, I may have a chance to start. You know, what was that like for you early on as a freshman in 97? Yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, growing up in Louisiana, it's something you want to do, right, is play for LSU. And then, you know, timing's everything. And like Eddie was talking about, a lot of the fifth-year seniors that were there his freshman year, I was, I guess, somewhat fortunate to be able to come into a situation where the only really returning starters were Eddie – and then yeah. Mike Kerner out in center field, right? So right. Yeah. everything had to be replaced. Um, you know, Coach Bertman was honest about that and said, look, I, in essence, this is how I feed my family. The, you know, my best nine are going to go at it. So if you can come in and be in that number, then then we'll give it a run. So naturally you go in there thinking, no, I'm going to go in there and fight for it, compete for it. Uh, really wanted it badly. Uh, and then we got going and there was a, a – I remember there being almost a sense of calm. Like I really felt good with the team. Eddie was great. You were great. I like, you know, and, and there was a comfort that I felt um, that was nice that later on in my career in different times, you might not have felt as comfortable. 
And uh, because of that, it was it was really nice. Once once I got going, you know, there's a couple types of confidences. One, when like Eddie was talking about, when we walk in, they're like, no, I think I'm going to be the guy. <laughs> and then you start to do it a little bit. And now that's a whole nother type of confidence that 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 comes. So I was able to kind of get going in the fall. But then the beautiful thing <laughs> in the spring was you know, hitting behind me was not only Eddie, it, it was Brandon Larson as well and Mike <laughs> right. Kerner. And that <laughs> list goes on and on and on through all night. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I sitting in front of those guys. Yeah, I didn't I didn't have to be quite as crafty as Eddie did or, or probably Larson did either. Yeah, I was going to see some fastballs, which was nice. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I think we've all had that moment to where I remember having that moment on the mound to where you walk in and you're like, can I can I do this at this level? Can I get these guys out? And it takes a while. Everybody has their own aha moment to where like, yeah, they're going to, you know, I threw against y'all in scrimmages, which was not fun. I mean, it was it was disastrous at times. It was horrible. And uh, but then you're like, you know, these guys will roll over. They will miss hit balls because they're human, obviously. And it takes a while to get there, especially at a program like LSU. Now, when y'all, and I don't necessarily remember this myself, but when y'all, Blair, you can kick this off. When y'all moved into conference play, so Blair, we were 19 and 0 going to Georgia yeah. in 97. I think that was our first SEC series. When y'all went to conference play, because I'm thinking about how LSU just got done with AM, they went on the road. Did y'all feel any more pressure? as freshmen going into SEC conference play, like, uh Oh, we got to step it up now, or this is a tick up in competition. Or did y'all think it was, uh, we're just going to, I'm here with my teammates. We're just going to roll out there and just kind of do what we do. You know, I, I want to give coach some credit on this one. I thought he did an amazing job really of preparing us for a lot of those things. As you guys remember, we would get the sheets and we would get his speeches and now we're, now we're about to get going in the conference play. And I remember specific, talks that he would give to us about dealing with pressure, about graduating, about, uh, you know, yeah, maybe it is bigger and some some techniques to deal with in that moment. But specifically, you know, that fear was the false evidence appearing real. And if you used that uh, that energy, what felt like fear or nervousness, and if you were able to corral that and and utilize it the right way, then it could be a real weapon. And. <clears throat> Having him let me know or or really affirm that it was human to feel that way. And then if you and then if that if you channeled it correctly, that adrenaline, that nervousness, because there were a lot of big moments. I mean, playing in your first conference game, playing your first home game, playing your first uh, regional game, playing in awe, yeah. you know, and and every year it's different. You know, the, those nerves are real. You know, you begin to look forward to getting them. You know, yeah. and, and because, you know, you're going to be ready, you know, you're prepared, you know, you're ready to go out there and do it and use it as a positive as opposed to a, a negative. So I want to give coach some credit for that. One. Yeah, no doubt. Eddie, what about you? I mean, I know 95. Look, we were not good at all. And I yeah. I just transferred in and uh, I, I sat at home. I didn't travel at all. I did a lot of charting that year. So uh, I don't know what it was like on the road, but obviously you're a freshman and uh, watched it on TV some. But uh any change or any change with regards to what Blair said, or how did you feel, you know, when SEC kind of came around, you know, and you talked about some of the nerves or if you can do it, you mentioned some of that earlier, was that still persistent or you had some games under your belt and you felt a little bit better? But I did not. I mean, I felt, I felt so much pressure the entire time Damn. that it really didn't feel any different. <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't. It felt just as much nervous as the, as the beginning of the year. Wow. Um, I think, you know, when I really started to feel kind of like that, don't, you know, I stopped giving a crap about me and what I did mm -hmm. and cared more about how the team did was right. Arkansas on the road. And it was the first time I'd, I'd read um, Ken Revis's uh, book on one pitch at a time, um, playing baseball one pitch at a time. Went to Arkansas on the on a on those buses that we had. And I really finally got into that. I don't give a crap. I'm just going to do what I can. I'm going right. to help the team. It's it's not that big a deal. I'm just going to do what I can. I hit three home runs in one game, right, on that Friday night. And then I felt so – then it was just like over. I was comfortable, and I finally felt like I wasn't a freshman anymore, right? And yeah. I could go into games, not really – but, but man, I tell you what, I think the difference between then and even 97, when I think there were like four SEC teams in the World Series, yeah. was right. – 
we would go under Vanderbilt thinking, okay, we're going to come out of here with, with a sweep. Right. We go into Kentucky, we're going to sweep. You know, it's just, we would go into places thinking, okay, we're going to sweep or man, we're going to go to Alabama and they're pretty good. And yeah, we're going to no, no. have to fight and maybe we'll get two out of three on a, on an SEC road trip, maybe one, but we're not going to get swept. Right. Uh, that, right. that was, that was never even a part of the conversation that we were ever going to get swept by anybody in the SEC. So, I think it was a little, there was a little less parity, I guess I would say, in, yeah. for the most part. So I didn't feel any different going to SEC games, except the parks were nicer. The players were better. They had some better recruits and things like that. But I still felt like our biggest competition was us. We had to, you know, we, we yeah. needed to go out there and do what we needed to do. And as long as we executed, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't a difference, except the scores might be a little closer. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting take. So, to piggyback off that, now now you look nowadays, right? Everything's all hyper-focused now, right? Perfect game events, rankings, Twitter, social media, kids getting recruited in eighth grade. So, Ed, throwing this to you first. So now when you look at the freshmen, and that's one of the reasons you all have such good perspective because of what you all have been through, and you all just talked about that. But when you look at, like, Kling, Neal, Jones, you know, what's your take on those guys so far, and then maybe even if you could go into a little bit of uh, maybe some slumps that y'all had, like Paxton Kling on the weekend, he goes one for 15 with eight Ks. He was unfortunately the DO. He's in the pitching terms, he was the designated out, unfortunately. And then Tim, like anytime he came up, all of a sudden the pitcher was like, Oh, I got this. Oh, two. And this poor kid, you know, just couldn't figure it out. But what have you seen from those guys so far? And just in terms of everything they have to deal with now, even like NIL, it's just so much more to deal with you know, and just their maturity level and they're stepped in and ready to play at this type of a level. I would say across the board and, and freshmen too, but across the board, um, there's so much more involved in being a player in the SEC or just in general in baseball now um, with their, the, the NIL, the, the, I mean, people can just look you up on, on Instagram and uh, Twitter and just, just tw tweet you, you know, yeah. um, you're always in that spotlight. You can't hide. Um, on, at any at any point, you can't hide. And then, you know, now you're you're coming into a situation, especially in an SEC and coming into an SEC um, SEC play and conference play, and that the the level of play is so much better. I mean, it's just, it really is. I mean, just objectively, oh, yeah. Yeah. the athletes are better. They're bigger, yeah. stronger. You know, I go up there and I, I mean, I go to see these recruiting classes and I'm six, three and I'm like the shortest dude in, you know, of all these recruits. I'm like, what in the heck just happened? Right. 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 And so I think th they're more athletic. They're better. They come in with a better, um, uh, just a better, more athletic build. They're quicker. Um, they have better exit velocity. They have better, yeah. better, better, better barrel control. And then on, on top of all that, all these teams have info. I mean, they know where your weak spot is yeah. when you're coming into the weekend. They, they, like just almost like MLB. They've got your hot zone. They've got your cold zone. They know that you're going to take a, a get them over curveball first pitch every time. Yeah. So they're just going to throw you a get them over curveball because you're yeah. going to take it. You know, yeah. they, th there's a lot of info out there. And you're breaking into a lineup with some uh, really good players with a lot of at-bats under their belt. And you're a freshman trying to break into that. Yeah. You've really got to be, you know, very well developed and have a lot of that that's under your belt and have something really special to break into these big lineups, especially when you consider the transfer portal. Yeah. And then the fact yeah. Blair that they've stayed there, right. Kling's just, yeah. you know, Neil, Neil's supposed to be a senior in high school and he's catching a hundred and dudes yeah. with different release points. I mean, what do you make of these? And Jones is leading the team in home runs. It's I mean, amazing. You, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with what Eddie said. I mean, they're so much more prepared. They're playing more games prior to. Uh, you have all the stats like, boy, wouldn't you have loved, Eddie, to have like, oh, wait, that's how I swing it the fastest and get the most and get mm -hmm. the right angle and get on. Like, and you know, they, they have so much more data that they can use to hone their skill. But it comes out, you, you referenced Paxton going 115. It comes down, you still have to play the game. And baseball is like most sports. I mean, a lot of it's up top and you, you, you've got to be able to deal with those ups and downs. So it's one thing to have all of the tools, which they all do. Impress, what's impressive to me is kind of their mental ability 
like you saw Jared Jones come out of the lineup and then go back in. You saw Paxton do the same thing, right? So for them to handle those sorts of things, you know, is going to really what's going to get them to the top of that pyramid. They, they, they've got it. It's not the stuff. That's for sure. You know, it's how good can they be up top? And if they can deal with that emotional roller coaster that baseball or sports in general brings to you, um, then they, you know, I mean, the sky is the limit for those three and others that, that we don't even know of yet right. sitting on the bench that are equally as impressive. Uh, these guys are in their spot in that lineup. But for all of them, even the even the guys that are tried and true, you know, you, you, you put you know, more arrows in your quiver every time you have another at bat, like Eddie said. And, and to do that and pair that with a, a, a really strong mental game where you have belief in yourself, where you're willing to be critical of yourself, listen to others, be critical and get to work about it uh, as opposed to mope about it. You know, that's how yeah. you get uh, out of those slumps. And and I think those guys are, are to get to this point and, and already getting those at bats on the number one team in the country. Yeah. Says a lot about both sides of their skill set, I believe. I totally agree. Yeah. Just, yeah, baseball is a cruel game, and for those guys to be able to succeed and fail and keep doing it against the arms and the talent they're facing says a lot about their mental makeup. For sure. So <clears throat> one of the things I noticed, obviously, looking at it from a pitching perspective, Blair, is – and I don't know. I'm sure you all have paid attention to it, but I guess when I see guys hit, I'm like, I wonder if I could get that guy out or would he right. just crush me. That's what I think a lot of times. Yeah. But yeah. the thing I've been most impressed about, and I, I can't wait to get your guys, both of you, um, y'all's take on this, is – this lineup, God, it is a pitcher's nightmare. They are willing to take pitches early in the count. They do not have a problem hitting with two strikes. They extend at bats with foul balls after foul balls. They spit on pitches in the dirt. They just seem very comfortable with their approach. I think Cruz is even more locked in this year with two strikes and then tanks behind him to where he, I think he had like five strikeouts heading into the weekend. Yeah. One – what do y'all think about this approach that they're taking? And then two, I'm curious, would y'all be comfortable with this approach if you had to go up there like that? Well, I, I, I tell you, I think I'm, I'm very impressed with the approach. And I think Eddie, Eddie would agree with me here. You, you, the first part of the question was referencing the arms. You know, it's a team approach to beating big arms. It can't be one guy great having point. a great at bat. Then not the next. It's got to be one through nine in the lineup, dragging this guy into battle after battle after battle, following him off, taking the tough pitch where he normally gets the strikeout, following and doing everything you can hit by pitch until you smoke one, right? And you get into that pitch count and you get into his head a little bit. So I think that that approach that they have is a championship approach. There is there isn't a, a week out in that lineup and they're probably 11 deep, really. You know, I mean, so when you look at that and you look back at championship teams at LSU, you're going to see a something similar. Right. I mean, in 97, we hit all the home runs. And in 2000, we hit 340 as a team, you know, with the minus three bats. So you can't do you can't hit 188 home runs or hit 340 as a team without everybody bringing it every single at bat. And that's how you went in, in the postseason as well. You've got to be able to beat those Friday night arms. You've got to be able to handle those guys because that's who you're going to have to beat in the postseason. So I absolutely love it, Moo. I think it's what they need to be doing. The power's there. The discipline's there. And the and the fight is there, right? I mean, we're just not going up there, you know, one, two, three, see you. I mean, this is – everybody in that lineup digs in and, and gets after it. Love it. Yeah, so I I agree with those with that a lot. I would say, Chris, what you're what you're alluding to, and some of these uh, guys that have a lot of power, is they're basically their bat speed and how you know how hard they can hit a ball, right? And you have guys that can swing it really hard, and then you have guys like a, let's say a Mookie Betts, who is a barrel control guy, who can really doesn't really doesn't swing and miss. Um, can really wait on pitches to come to him, and then he doesn't have to worry about two strikes because his barrel, his bat to barrel skills are so good that he's gonna he's gonna put balls in play, and so which is really great. Now, when you combine those two things, when you have a guy like Dylan Cruz who has incredible bat speed, who can wait a long time before he, his swing decision is made, and then when he actually swings the bat, he doesn't miss. 
Right. That's barrel control. And so he can he can take it way deep into counts. If you don't have a lot of good barrel control, let's say you're Tommy Tanks, who, who has great barrel control, by the way. But let's say he doesn't. Right. right. He's going to try to hit the ball as hard and as far as he can. Those first two swings and just let it eat, like maximize bat speed because he wants to he wants to get it over the fence. And once he gets to two strikes, we're in trouble because his barrel control isn't there. Well, with with those guys right now, they have the barrel barrel control where they don't have to worry about going to two strikes because they're not going to swing and miss. Right. They're going to have the bat speed and the barrel control to put it on the ball and put it in play, which there's a value to that. Just putting it in play is a value to that. But putting right. it, putting it in play over 95 miles an hour, which they do almost every sing, single swing. That's yeah. that's huge. I mean, that, that gives you a, a great batting average and it gives you a good slugging percentage, which produces runs for them. Yeah, no. I mean, I think you are 100 percent correct. And I, I, put, I think I put on my Twitter account this week exactly what y'all said is that. They're a pitcher's nightmare because the lineup has depth. Blair, to your point, they've all bought in to this approach. Eddie, to your point, they're grinding out at bats, grinding out at bats. But when they get their pitch, even if it's two strikes, and I'm talking about a lot of the mature guys, the middle of the order, they just don't miss mistakes. Or like Morgan and Joe Bear have been victims of the shift, but they're still hitting balls 95 to 102 miles an hour, Eddie. Like you said, just right at people because they got the analytics and the data. Yeah. But to me as a pitcher, it's just like y'all were in 97. And these guys, it's, you know, Morgan, Cruz, White, Dugas. Then you add in Jones with his pop. Pearson is all of a sudden back in the lineup looking like his old self. Kling, Thompson, Neal, and Joe Bear can come off the bench. As a pitcher, it's so taxing to be like, okay, I got past Barbier after seven pitches. Now I got Furnace. Like mentally, I can't make a mistake because Blair's on first. Oh, then I got Larson. Now it's first and third because Furnace just hit a, a, a piss rod off of me. Okay, oh, then I got Cressy as a DH or I got Cedric Harris or Kerner. Like there's just – you just can't miss, and it's mentally taxing. And, oh, I got to go out and do that the next inning? Bro, that is just not fun. Eddie, when you look at this lineup, I mean, do you – it's early, right? They still have to get through the gauntlet of the SEC. But does it feel a little bit like 97 in terms of – now, a lot of people listening or watching may not know, but just in terms of the depth, um, the buy-in, the no the no let-up, you know, anybody in the lineup can hurt you. You know, does oh, it feel a little bit like that? Absolutely, and they, and they can all put it over the fence. You know, yes. I think – you know, I think we've gone from the dead ball. Well, you know, we were at the live bat you know, <laughs> yeah. in 97 yeah. to 2000 ish. Right. Yeah. And then we went to a dead bat era and well, actually a dead bat, dead ball. So we had yeah. both. And then we were like at point three home runs a game and they were just terrible to watch. Um, you know, guys were leaning on pitches and barely getting into the warning track. Right. Just absolutely right. destroying balls and barely getting a warning track. Now you've got a kind of a dead bat, wood bat, but a live ball. And now you can see that in the lineup. So now we don't have just, you know, a bunch of shortstops on the field. We have a we have an actual structured lineup where the corners are big cats, you know, with a lot of bats yeah. swinging it hard and really getting the ball. You know, exit velocities are up. They're really trying to hit the ball far. And you got a middle of the middle of the field, which is still doing the same thing, even though it's you know they may not be supposed to, but they are. And yeah. so I think you're back to a 97 ish type of lineup to where you're trying to let it eat a little bit on those first couple pitches and, and put it over the fence, really generate some runs. Yeah. Blair, what you think about that in terms of this lineup, the depth of it, the pop, like Eddie said? I, I love it. I'm, you know, big, strong, and aluminum again. You know, it, it's, you know. <laughs> that works, right? That works. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard. You might hit it, and it might go out of the park. Right. I mean, because, look, there's – and that's – you know, that is LSU baseball. I mean, we are the three-run – we hit three-run home runs. You know I mean? We're not trying to do that. So, so to Eddie's point, you know, and and Paul had to manage through some of that dead bat area era and yeah. had to deal with a lot of that. Um, you know, everybody down here loves the big ball, but you know, he, he put up a lot of wins, a championship, a lot of uh, of SEC championships, uh, managing through that style. But I, I am glad to see, um, you know, college baseball needs to have a differ different um experience than professional baseball like professional baseball i mean it's awesome to go watch a guy out there throwing 100 and you know two of them and they give up a few hits it's great defense and oh my goodness so it's like a, a a goal in soccer you know when they score sometimes but college baseball needs a different brand mm -hmm. and the home runs per game need to be up the games don't need to be one nothing two one 
Let's see him score. Let's let him be exciting. And uh, I'm I'm happy the NCAA has come around and gotten us to uh, gotten gotten more gotten us more to that sort of brand as opposed to the the dead bat era for sure. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I think it's a much more enjoyable experience at the ballpark to when you see, you know, runs put up. Obviously, pitchers have to work hard. That's that's regardless. But that brings me to our next section. We're going to transition into the pitchers. All right, Blair, Eddie. So let let let's. I just want to take y'all, envision this, you know, we're getting ready to sit down for our Friday meeting. So for those, uh, we would come in around four, of, we'd have batting practice, but then around four, I guess around 5.30, we go to our meeting rooms, we sit down for the scouting report, and we sit down, and the whiteboard says, Skeens, 97 to 100, two seam, 95-96, change up, 90-91, slider, curveball, slider, 82. <laughs> just I gotta get y'all's opinion. Eddie, we we text a little bit about this weekend. Yeah. Um Blair, I'll go with you first. First of all, what are you thinking when you see that scout report? And then I mean, how do you I know y'all probably thought about it. You had to have. How do you approach schemes if you gotta dig into the box on this guy? Well, this is this is what I would I, I'm gonna go go back to we're playing Arkansas and Dan Wright, who eventually <laughs> pitched in the big leagues, is starting. Yeah. And I'm standing on deck. Trey McClure's leading off, or maybe Danny. Then I was, you know, and so we're all out there. And yes. back then, it was fair to get, you know, the the signal for how hard he was throwing from the from the deal. And I don't know who was up there. Uh, might have been Doug. you. It, was, it might have been it was, you. Uh, um, uh, me or Doug? I don't know. I think Doug may have been up there. So whoever it is, I would have thought the same thing that Trey McClure thought. And <laughs> the stands gives the you know five I, like he's throwing a hundred basically or nine you know so Trey we so we think y'all are you know being your typical y'all. selves no I'm joking uh, yeah you don't you don't really think he's throwing ninety six yeah I'd have walked in that clubhouse and thought no chance somebody's messing with us this kid throws that but then I'd have felt like Trey did when Trey literally took that first pitch. <sighs> Looked at me on the on deck circle and said, "He is, bro. He is, bro. <laughs> he is throwing ninety six, bro. He, he is." is. <laughs> how, how, do you, how, do, yeah. how do you deal with it? With with that, I, you know, I mean, there's so many, there's so many theories. I, I go back to one thing. This is a team approach to beat that guy. We need to get into that pitch account. We need to file him off. We need to do our best not to miss. You probably have to eliminate his slider. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to You got to get into some things technique wise. I ain't mean, cheat with your back, but do whatever you can, because that ball looks like a ping pong ball at a, up a, uh, and at a, you, you maybe we, but if it got above 97, I mean, it got really, really small, you know, yeah. below that, you can see it a little bit, really at 97 or above. It's humming. Yeah. Go ahead. It did. And you, and you swing under it because it's really it, flat. It doesn't drop it. as much. And yeah. so, you know, you get to a point where you, you start to have to realize that even in the big leagues, the average miss is 11 inches. That's the average miss. And so you start thinking, he's going to, he's just a college pitcher. He's going to miss and he's going to put a fastball right down the middle. And I better swing about two balls over it or I'm going to miss it. Yeah. And you're going to, and, and if you watch, and I've watched, he'll throw a fastball right down the middle multiple times an inning. Yeah. And they'll just they'll just straight up miss, miss it. it. Yeah. Whereas whereas Trey Turner is not missing that pitch. Yeah. He's not. Mookie Betts is not missing that pitch. You know, and, and my gosh, Mike Trout's putting it on, you know, over the scoreboard, right? That's yeah. the difference between a big league hitter and a college hitter. Now, Skeens, on the other hand, he needs to realize he's just facing college hitters. And if he misses at a hundred over the middle, eh, you know, who cares? <laughs> not a lot of guys are gonna do that. They're not gonna hit it. But as a hitter, You've got to really, I mean, either go in there and, and get your hack attack or your spin ball machine and crank it up to a hundred and watch it not drop because you will swing, you'll swing under it. And so I'm thinking, you know, look for that fastball. It's going to, he's going to miss with it. It's going to come right down the middle. And if you're ready for it, you don't even have to swing that hard. It's going to go a long way, but you got to get on top of it. Yeah. It's uh, he's been uber impressive this year from a pitching standpoint. I mean, I'm sure from a hitter standpoint, and then you see his two-seamer, you know, that sucker moves, yeah. obviously. Ed, you would have to deal with that from the left-hand side of things, you know. Yeah. Uh, but now tell me about this. So you got, so let's say you got Skeens coming in, right? You get him out the game in the sixth or the seventh. He's reached 100 pitches. 
Now, is this something that maybe the media portrays or, or people blow out of proportion? Because I've always wondered this, and I never really had a chance to ask y'all. I hadn't really hadn't thought about. It. But say you got Skeens, but then they bring in Ackenhausen or Cooper, the lefty, to change things up on y'all. And they're still 90 to 92, right, with a slider for a strike. And they'll probably face you first, and they'll get around to Blair if they're still in the game. But does that really mess with y'all in terms of seeing Skeens for six innings and then having to adjust mentally and approach-wise to seeing a lefty in terms of release point and stuff? Or just y'all y'all have taken so many hacks at that point mentally, y'all are like, oh, okay, just somebody else to look at. Because, you know, the media or everybody always blows it. Is, are they blowing that out of proportion? Is that a big deal to y'all, Eddie? Well, I would say, I mean, yeah, just seeing – one, just seeing a lefty, you know, okay. is different. Two, just seeing a different release point, you know, it's going to take you a couple pitches. So if they go okay. one strike, one strike, two, you know, it, yeah, it's a little hard. Now, the other thing is, I mean, just from a data analytics standpoint, that's why they change pitchers in the big leagues after one time, maybe two through the lineup. Because you just start getting used to it, so I think just from just the fact that the big leaguers and the, and the big leagues teams change pitchers, no matter how good the, the starters doing, tells you that you need to know it makes a big difference to switch pitchers. Yeah. Now he's not going to go deep in the games because he's got to strike people out. You know, right. Skeens has to strike people out, so he can't. Nobody's going to like. He's not going to get like thirteen ground balls and, and get out <laughs> of the innings quick. He's right. going to have to throw at least nine pitches to people. You know, yeah. every inning. So he's going to go – and he's not going to be able to hit that spot every single time. So he's going to go five, six innings and, and just like hit 90 pitches because nobody can hit him. The so, burden of throwing 100, right? It is. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> but, uh, being a strikeout pitcher. Let, yeah. Let, Blair, let, Blair. let me say this. When the guy's throwing 100 and they take him out the game, <laughs> he's really happy. You know? <laughs> Yes. Okay. We, Absolutely. Yeah. No, I hear you. But did that mess you up too, Blair? Like, obviously, you know, uh, like say the, the crafty lefty or, or even a righty with a different arm slot. I, I mean, that would, I never just asked y'all, you know, I just assumed y'all would adjust pretty quick. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's funny. You, you, when you, you get up to the, to the play, you see him. And there are times where it's the guy throwing very hard, 95 and above. Boy, but you're locked in. You see it good. You're on it. And, and it's just, man, it's good. And then you get another righty. You know, it's throwing 86. And for some reason, you can't, I don't, I can't get it. So to me, that first pitch, I wasn't a go up and swing at the first pitch kind of guy. I like to get deep in the count. But if I was picking it up, you know, th that, that to more so than, oh my goodness, they changed. What am I going to do? If I didn't see it well, I mean, maybe drag do some fight as hard as I can. But to me, it was early. You would know pretty early. Am I picking this up out of his hand or not? Like, especially when they spend that first breaking ball. If I see it and I'm not offering at it, um, you know, feeling pretty good. So it was really pitcher by pitcher when they would bring in that new guy because you knew they were coming. And boy, but if you could see him, hi, Ed. I mean, if you could see it out of his hand and oh, my goodness, and you didn't have to really eliminate anything and, uh, you know. That, that felt good. Yeah. I could tell you, I remember a time this happened. Um, 96 World Series, they had the lefty, Miami had the lefty throw in. I'm blanking on his name. Um, J.D. Arteaga? Arteaga, yeah. Oh. Really, really good lefty. I mean, led, I mean, he's like got their strikeout record. Really good. Made me he's look the head stupid. coach. He's the head coach of Miami. He is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. And, and, and just made me look stupid on a, on a lot of stuff, really. <laughs> really good. But then they brought in Morrison. Yeah. And I was going to have an at bat against him. I knew flat out that if he threw me a pitch, I was going to hit it over the zoo. I just knew. I mean, like as soon as as soon as he went in, I was like, oh, it's done. They better walk me. And they did. But I, I just yeah. knew. I was so, so glad that Artiaga was out of the game and I was getting to see a righty. Oh, I was right. locked in too. I was right. ready to go. So that that was actually a really good thing for me. I, that really boosted. I was like, finally, I'm going to get something coming into me and I'm going to, I'm going to blast it. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Well, um, I want to respect these guys' time. We're going to wrap up. I got one more question for each of them here on the 60 Feet 6 Inches podcast. I can't thank my special guests, Blair Barbie and Eddie Furness, enough for taking time out of their night and joining me. Blair, I'll start with you. You know, you had an opportunity to talk to the team this spring. Jay Johnson asked you to come in. You know, we used to be on the flip side of that, right? We used to be sitting in those chairs watching guys come in, and now you were the guy talking to the team. You know, just tell me a little bit about that experience. Uh, if you caught any kind of a vibe from that team, you know, I'm not sure how long you were there. And, you know, just maybe if Jay talked to you about the team as well, just 
how was that being on the flip side? You know, back in our day, we were sitting there watching you talk. Yeah, no, you know, it was, it was, uh, what a cool experience. I was honored that Jay, uh, asked me to, to, to come by and chat with him. I want to go, go back to something that Ed said when he was on his recruiting trips, you know, we took a picture after, you know, and it, it looked like we're on, you know, raised bleachers, you know, because they're just so massive. I mean, every one of them. So of course, one of them that's six, seven puts his arm around from the picture. I'm like, absolutely not. You know, give me, give me anybody under six foot, come on give down. Give me two guys. Give me two yeah, guys. Right? guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love you got my arm around them, you know, but it looked like yeah. they, were, they, they were massive. But, you know, it was – um but you know you can tell when when somebody's locked in and when they're when they're they they're serious about what they're doing. And and quite frankly, we were able to talk about a lot of things that we're talking about right now. You know, the need to be able to hit one through nine and how you have to deal with the front line arms, right? And what it's gonna take to to get through a season and how games start. So we we're able to get into a lot of that stuff, a, a lot even some about the history and uh, of LSU and, and, yeah. and what we had to do. And Jay is very serious, right? He's all baseball all the time. And um, you know, he, he, he has those, he has those guys locked in and it was, it was, it was good to chat with him. It was good to say some of those things that, that I know we all, the three of us believe matters in championship baseball, right? Not just kind of yeah. getting through, but what you, what you're going to have to deal with, to make it all the way down to the end and what you're going to have to have from a arsenal perspective, right? With I don't know, 10 or 11, Hey, like we got to hit one through nine and we got, we need eight or nine arms to get through and, and to be able to talk with those guys about that and have them to be receptive, have me there all day. I mean, it was an amazing uh, experience. And I was, I was very thankful that, uh, that Jay had asked. Very cool. Very cool. And Ed, you have a, you have a interesting dynamic, right? Cause your son's a freshman at Ole Miss. Uh, I think his first college hit was a home run, right? I think was, I remember seeing you. Put, I mean, that's crazy. And obviously, he's playing for all of our old coach with Mike Bianco up there. So you've seen, I guess, a little bit of both sides of it, right? As a parent, for somebody in that situation, you lived it yourself. And then obviously, you have Bio, who's up there as well. But um, maybe just speak about what it's like to be on the opposite side now, being a parent and watching your son at that level. You know, I don't know if y'all talk a lot of ball or he just thinks, well, your dad, he can't tell you you weren't good because you were one of the best SE players ever. Like he can never say that, but you know, what's that like for you as a parent now being on the opposite side of that fence and just seeing him really succeed at such a high level early on. Oh, it's, it's awesome. It really is cool. And, you know, and to, to see him doing the same, uh, same things and, and actually um, you know, the same system that we, that's were what in. I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. I was it wondering is, about no, that. It's the same. I mean, it's the same, same stuff, you know, we, like if you hear something again, it does, you're in a different place. I mean, it's the same stuff. It really, right. so it's really cool to hear some of those, you know, ask Will, Hey, have y'all heard this yet? And yeah, we did hear that the other day. <laughs> so it's kind of fun kind of reliving a little bit, but you know, I think the biggest thing is, is I don't have, you know, as a parent, we, we kind of live through our kids a little bit, but I mm -hmm. felt like this whole time through all the recruiting process and everything, and I, I didn't have to live through him at all. I mean, I was just able to, 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 you know, kind of guide him in the ways that, that uh, things that I had trouble with. Um, one is that, you know, that you belong, you know, if they recruit you into the SEC, anybody, you belong there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you, you don't have to wonder about that. I mean, you're going to do great. You're going to do fine. Um, you know, enjoy some things that you might have missed otherwise. Like, you know, you, you get so nervous and caught up in what you're doing that you don't look around and, and look and say, you know, I'm, I'm in front of 5,000 people right now. Right. You know, yeah. and, and and I also I think the biggest thing is that one of the big things I tell them is that you're not going to feel good and confident, you know, at the plate. You're just not. And that's a luxury. When you do, you'll know it. But that's a luxury. Right. You're going to go up there. You're going to be able to perform when you're not feeling good, when you're feeling bad, when you're feeling like you don't belong. And you just got to be able to take a deep breath and battle it out and have a good at bat. In the end, you know, you either just put it in play, do your job, get them over, get them in, just do those little things that I've taught you since you were eight, yeah. you know, and, and it's no different. The field's just bigger and the ball's coming harder, but, but you belong there and go out and compete the best you can. And yeah, that's all you can ask, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really enjoy the moment of it. <clears throat> yeah. That's, um, that's amazing. And, uh, look, 
I could sit here with y'all for two hours. I don't think people would listen for two hours. Maybe they would, but I cannot thank y'all enough. Obviously, my teammates, my brothers, I love y'all. So look, that's going to do it for this episode of the 60 Feet, 6 Inches podcast. Thank y'all for tuning in. Blair Barbier, Eddie Furness. I don't know if you're going to get a better perspective on how tough is it to start at LSU as a freshman. Uh, They were both on two national championship teams. We talked about the hitters, this lineup, what they think about those guys, how they would hit this pitching staff, and just some of the the behind-the-scenes stuff they've experienced with Blair talking to the team. And obviously, Eddie, his son, is uh, up there at Ole Miss with Coach Bianco. So I can't thank them enough for their time and insight into LSU baseball, really. So, guys, thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Mo. Yeah, anytime. So as a reminder, guys, this episode will be linked on the Twitter account and available on the YouTube channel as well. Next up, be on the lookout for the Arkansas preview. That's going to drop later this week. So until next time, y'all stay safe. And as always, go Tigers.